Okay, good morning, Friday a vasculitis review session, vasculitis and related entities. Um, all right, let's start with case one. Um, uh, who wants to go uh, tell me what this one is? Or do I just tell you guys what it is? Yeah, so these are, I mean, I think these are still relatively small vessels. They look bigger, they're kind of expanded, but most of the vessels are in the dermis. And I, I think of most of the dermal vessels as being kind of on the smaller side, although I guess it depends, you know, uh, what scale you're using. But like you said, the, the thing from low power is this is superficial and deep, right? The vessels in the superficial, mid and deep dermis are all involved and it seems to be going down even to the subcutis. And when you look at the infiltrate, there's numerous eosinophils, right? Eosinophils everywhere. And even right here, like see this vessel, it's not, you don't see obvious vasculitis here, at least I don't, but it does not look like a happy vessel. It's swollen. It's like the endothelial cells are bulging into the lumen so much that you can't even see the lumen. So that to me is an evidence usually that there's some sort of vascular irritation or damage. And I'm going to look more carefully to see if I can find vasculitis in that context. And then over here, I think we are starting to see it. You can really see blood leaking through the vessel wall, some fibrin right here, fibrinoid necrosis, not a ton of neutrophils here, at least that, not that I can see. Although on uh, when there's a lot of EOS, sometimes neutrophils and EOS kind of uh, mimic each other a little bit. You can up close on a light microscope, you can see, cause you can see the granules on the EOS and the granules on neutrophils are really, really tiny. You can't see them uh, unless you have like oil immersion. And this is a really damaged, torn up vessel here with you know, endothelial swelling and fibrinoid necrosis, the vessel wall. So it's basically a, a variation of leukocytoclastic vasculitis in which there are a lot of eosinophils and it's superficial and deep. So like you said, right away, you want to think of Churg-Strauss um, disease, which is uh, also known as eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis or EGPA. Um, I've seen some cases that just look like regular LCV, but with EOS, this one's like really florid in EOS. Sometimes the EOS um, uh, can kind of be, cause degeneration of the collagen, and you can get things that look almost like palisading of granulomas, like kind of like you like uh, like histiocytes or eosinophils clumping around collagen bundles. So some cases of Church Strauss will show that. But I think anytime I see a leukocytoclastic vasculitis with a lot of EOS, I want to keep Church Strauss in mind. And then they can clinically check if the patient, do they have asthma? Because this patient's essentially always, I think, have asthma and other lung issues. And then they can do additional workup like testing the, uh, for ANCAs. And uh, that also, I think, is a, a key uh, kind of a general take home about vasculitis is that when you have cutaneous LCV, the kind of simple form of LCV, leukocytoclastic vasculitis limited to the skin, usually it involves the, uh, the vessels up here in the superficial vascular plexus, and you don't usually get deeper involvement. When I see really robust vasculitis, particularly that's going way down deep in the dermis, that is right away suggestive that this is some form of systemic vasculitis. It's not a hard and fast rule, but I actually often even put in my pathology report, there's a lot of deep vessel involvement, which is particularly concerning for, for one of the systemic forms of uh, vasculitis. And also if you see vasculitis that's so robust that it's causing either necrosis of the epidermis, pustule formation, or blister formation, that again suggests such a severe and, and usually goes hand in hand with deeper vessel involvement that it's so bad that it's cutting off blood flow to the skin and causing some ischemic change, which is degenerating the epidermis. Again, that often is a sign that it's a systemic vasculitis. So Churg-Strauss uh, syndrome, good. All right. Case two. Right. You picked up the most important thing here. Regardless of what's causing this, you have to be able to recognize this. Like this is a critical skill in Dermpath. Recognize acute ischemia. The epidermis 
begins to degenerate. It gets pale. The nuclei start to shrink up and then die. The whole epidermis gets a pale change when it fully dies. This is not entirely dead. It's like from Monty Python, I'm not quite dead yet, but it's on its way out. Okay, that's all dead there. This stuff is still hanging on for dear life, but not for long. The epidermis is starting to break away from the dermis and blister. The dermis itself looks kind of wiped out. There's hemorrhage as the as ischemia continues. A lot of times there's the you uh, leak out of the blood vessels into the dying dermis as the, the vessels begin to die. Of course, so one of the greatest signs of acute ischemia is to find necrotic eccrine coils. I'm not sure if those are present in this case or not, actually. I didn't, didn't look, but anyway, you'll often see them. And um, so, yeah, then you have to, anytime you see that, you've got to figure out why. Is it thrombotic vasculopathy from DIC or systemic coagulopathy? Is it an embolus? Is it calciphylaxis? Is it angioinvasive fungus? All those things. Once I see this, I have to figure out why it's happening because it's most of those things are potentially medical emergencies, right? So here, it would be tempting to just say, look, there's thrombi. I mean, those are thrombi and vessels. Now, I don't know. Maybe that's happening secondary. But like you said, you're a very astute that you picked up on. This one focus down here that would have been easy to miss, especially think if this punch pipe so didn't go deep enough, we would have never seen this. And this is something that I rarely see. Um, it must happen. I just don't know if it doesn't get biopsy because I don't think of it as being a super rare thing. But these are cholesterol clefts, these little spaces where cholesterol crystals were. And I think they look quite similar to the little cleft-like spaces that you can see keratin fragments leave in granulomas. Obviously, this is inside a vessel, so this is not going to be keratin. But I do feel like uh, they kind of have a similar shape. But in any case, these are cholesterol uh, crystals, and there's some fibrin there. So this is a piece of, of atheroma, basically, from a person with um, atherosclerosis that's broken free in their aorta or somewhere and, and flowed, uh, went through the blood all the way out to the extremities and got stuck in a vessel. And then, uh, you know, the problem is, is that these patients often get multiple little uh, cholesterol emboli. They can involve the brain and other sites, and so it can be a real serious problem. Um, aside from the ischemia that it causes in the skin, this is a this is a problematic situation for the patient. So there you go. That is a nice example of a cholesterol embolus, and then the the downstream effect of the whatever the blood flow in that watershed area has been cut off, and now you're getting um, necrosis of the epidermis. So yeah, anytime you're thinking of ischemic necrosis, coagulopathy, that kind of thing, getting a deep biopsy, ideally with ample subcutis, is really key because a lot of the things that cause acute ischemia are going to be seen better down deep. Down, and, you know, the more dramatic the ischemia is clinically, the more you have to think about the fact that there may be some deeper involvement and that the key may lay down in the subcutis. So getting that deep biopsy, either doing a double punch or an ellipse, that can be really helpful. Uh, for us to be able to give you an answer when you're biopsying these patients. Okay, case three. Okay, so here we have um, like a quick case biopsy. If we can go to the second piece, it has a better example. Mm -hmm. um, so in a kind of superficial dermis, uh, superficial reticular dermis, um, there are some vessels. Um, they look like uh, very rounded cannonball vessels. And they're plugged in, you can see with this pink uh, blobs, pink material. Um, I guess you could call them jello dribblers. Um, <laughs> and um, you can see a red vessel extravasation, but there's not a lot of inflammation. There's not, not no features of LTV seen. So this is more of a vasculopathy uh, type of process. And um, so we thought that for this one, it's type 1 cryoglobulinemia. Yeah, I mean, you've got pink blobs plugging up multiple vessels and unfortunately this this slide is a touch pale i mean i feel like a lot of times they're like kind of a bit brighter pink than this and here they didn't scan quite as quite the same color i usually think but it's a very homogeneous pink to, and this is cryoglobulins but i feel like cryoglobulin type 1 and fibrin thrombi can look pretty similar they they do often have a, a slight difference in color but um but they are similar in appearance so anytime i see something that looks like fibrin thrombi and vessels my differential is basically fibrin thrombi and cryoglobulinemia. And I, I call that, like you said, I'll say usually thrombotic vasculopathy and that systemic uh, coagulation issues need to be excluded. So you got to do laboratory workup coag studies to make sure it's not DIC, HUS, some sort of other inherited or acquired coagulopathy or cryoglobulinemia type 1. And I include that in there because I think a lot of times clinically, to, to some some uh, some physicians are not as um, 
uh, savvy to that. It's a, not a super common thing. And I think also uh, it sometimes presents in unusual ways. I've seen multiple times where it had an unusual atypical clinical presentation and um, uh, was not at all expected. And so I routinely include, please just do cryo in the workup. Because, you know, you have to collect it and send it to the lab in a special way to, you know, with certain temperature boundaries to make sure that it gets uh, uh, get, so that the specimen's good enough and the check for the cryo. And um, I think it can get overlooked otherwise. So like you said, type 1 uh, cryo is monoclonal, usually IgM, and is often associated with myeloma, Waldenstrahl's macroglobulinemia, and other, uh, you know, uh, plasma cell or lymphocyte clonal abnormalities. And of course, the type 2 and 3 mixed cryo will have this, these plugs, plus you have vasculitis neutrophils. And those are mixtures, usually of IgG and IgM. Let me show you an example of, uh, here's an example of, the, of a PAS stain. This was mixed cryo. You can see some neutrophils here and there's damage to the vessel wall. But the cryoglobulin deposits often stain really strongly on PAS. So that's a cryoglobulin. Okay. It doesn't look very exciting from low power, right? I mean, a little something up here, but otherwise, kind of normal skin. Yeah, and on a little bit closer, it looked like there were some EOs and nukes surrounding the vessel, but not really um, like an LCD. Just the nukes and EOs were um, in the vessel, so just right there. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see on this scan. It's a little blurry, but there's a couple EOs around this vessel. Probably might be a, a neutrophil somewhere in here. Some lymphs, pretty sparse, very mild sparse infiltrates. And what about the dermis here? Is there a little extra pale space in between the collagen bundles, you think? Yeah. You can always hallucinate it if you want to. I think this is legit. Like, I think this is really edema here. There's extra fluid pushing the collagen apart. But sometimes we see that as an artifact. So it's a edema is a little bit in the eye of the beholder, especially down in the reticular dermis. In the papillary dermis, it's a little easier usually to see and tell that edema is real. Like here, the, the, the pale, like fine collagen, that usually goes with real edema. But down here in the reticular dermis, you know, you can, if you want there to be edema, you can say there's edema. And if you don't, you can say, no, there's no edema. All right. So then what did you, uh, what do you think this is probably classified as? Yeah, urticaria, that would be great. Scattered, usually it's sparse infiltrate, the edema and sparse inflammation, and it's usually a mixture of neutrophils, EOs, um, and uh, lymphocytes, and, and sometimes scattered mast cells, and they can be like around the vessel. Neutrophils in the vessel lumen, like kind of collecting in the vessel lumen is a really nice clue. You don't always see it though. Um, there's some thought that there are different kind of categories of urticaria microscopically, some of which are more lymphocyte predominant and some have the neutrophils. I find the neutrophil ones to be easier. The other things I think of when I see this is could this be a dermal hypersensitivity reaction that's really mild? Could this be a bug bite or a drug eruption? Um, and also viral exanthem. Those are kind of things that can give you like the really sparse, mild, superficial perivascular dermatitis, but the scattered EOs and newts, I think are a good clue to push it towards urticaria. The other thing I found in practice is that at least when it's being submitted by a dermatologist, if the biopsy, if, if you guys as a dermatologist didn't put urticaria on your differential, then I got to think twice before calling something urticaria because urticaria has a kind of distinct clinical appearance, right? It really makes the wheel, the wheel and flare puffy, no epidermal change. And you guys, I think, as dermatologists, are really good at picking up on that and saying, oh, I think it looks urticarial. And so if you don't think it looks urticarial, then, then you know, I've got to really think, am I sure it's urticaria? So that's one, that's kind of a clue that I use, that, that usually urticaria will be on your differential if that's really what it is. Oh, and one other point, urticarial vasculitis can be really subtle and can look essentially identical to urticaria in some cases. Sometimes it has actual LCV, but what I've seen, the cases of, of what we thought were urticarial vasculitis that I've seen in practice, I felt like tend to be really on the, the light end of the LCV spectrum. Sometimes there's some hemorrhage and a little dust, but not like full-blown good LCV uh, and vasculitis. So even though it's called urticarial vasculitis, sometimes it can really look like urticaria. And I know there's sometimes a 
when derms are biopsying and want to decide if something's urticaria or urticarial vasculitis, please tell me how long have the individual lesions been present? Because that's one of the real criteria that I think of is that you should have fixed lesions. It should look like urticaria, but the individual lesions are fixed for more than 24 hours in true urticarial vasculitis. So, um, so occasionally I'll have people send me biopsy to, and put those both in the differential, but not tell me how long the individual lesions are there. So, so I can't really um, definitively usually tell you if, if I don't know that. All right. Number five. All right. So we have a, a small lady punch biopsy. And in the upper reticular dermis, there's a lot of these dilated kind of cannonball vessels. Um, they don't look flat. They're not real, like, vibrant. There's a lot of... Um, some areas and hemosiderin too, so probably like a chronic process. Um, not a ton of inflammation for like a pigmented purpura dermatosis, so probably just like a venous stasis type picture. Yeah, good. So the, these are great example of stasis vessels, right? And um, as you get vascular stasis, use of the lower legs, and most people have, most adults have at least some degree of this, but this is pretty prominent. Like you said, the vessels are clustered together um and and make these little lobules and they have thick walls their endothelial cells are very plump usually and just they're they're the same kinds of they're basically the normal capillaries in the papillary dermis that have just gotten really thick and kind of tangled up as as they've had constant back pressure from the poor venous flow and so um they make these lobules they often have fibrosis in the background they often have hemosiderin and extravasated Red blood cells, like you said, they don't um, they don't often have a ton of inflammation. Although remember that you know, a lot of times people have stasis and then they get kind of stasis dermatitis, which is probably what's going on here because see there's sponge derm over it. So when I see sponge derm on the lower leg, uh, there's often stasis under it, and so I have a, you know a kind of a code that says that sponge and there's stasis. So it could be stasis derm, could be contact plus underlying stasis, could be any combination of sponge derm plus stasis and how much the stasis is contributing to the dermatitis itself is variable. And like you said, the pigmented purpura is the other thing that can look kind of like this, but the big, and, and can coexist with this sometimes too, but I wanna see more lymphocytes and pigmented purpura uh, usually than here. But there are some EOS scattered in here, and I promise you, on any lower leg biopsy, if you give me a biopsy from the shin, I will find you an eosinophil, usually multiple. I don't know, I kind of wonder if it's like a special site for EOS, I swear there are always eosinophils there, like always. So I think probably what it is is that when people get rashes there, they're putting some sort of, you know, salve or, or cream or essential oils on it, and then it gets some sort of a contact component to it. So anyway, that's a nice example of stasis vascular changes. And occasionally this can be so severe that it begins to get a lot of spindled fibroblasts in the background, and then it can mimic Kaposi sarcoma, both clinically and microscopically. Or, so that pseudo Kaposi sarcoma uh, pattern, we call that acroangiodermatitis, which is basically just a severe form of stasis, and you can easily do an HHV8 stain. This does not look like like that to me, really. It doesn't really look like uh, Kaposi, but I would not fault someone if they had trouble. Just do the stain, and you can easily sort it out, but usually you can tell the part on H. Now, this is a great case here. This is one that I rarely get to see. What's going on? What, why do we, what, are, what are these things? Yeah. Um, I guess this is the only thing I feel like that looks like this that may come onto a derm path desk. And it's either the artery or uh, or the other vein. And this one looks like a true artery. It's nice and round. It's got a really thick vascularis, kind mm -hmm. of in a like fashion. Um, so normally I feel like they biopsy for the temporal artery when they're looking for giant cell arteritis. They're looking for some inflammation and kind of degradation of the internal elastic, elastic between them. And there was quite a bit of inflammation in this one. Um, some kind of granulomatous inflammation, um, and then a little bit of like what I said, clinic as well. So I think we can call it. Oh, yeah. So this is like a florid, nice, probably untreated example of giant cell arteritis of the temporal artery or temporal, ar temporal arteritis. And like you said, it's got to be a muscular artery that they're biopsying. And then when they when they do this, then we cut it up. They get a, give us a length of temporal artery and we cut it up in the lab into small pieces, and then it gets embedded very carefully by a skilled skilled histotech to make sure that they all stand up right. I mean, that, that's not easy to do. That's really pretty impressive they get these in there. I think sometimes they use like auger 
like you know like the plates that you would run auger gel I've, uh, I know some people will put them in that to get them kind of stabilized, but I've never actually done it, so I don't know. So to tell you're dealing with an artery, for one thing, like you said, having a real thick, well-formed muscle around it is probably an artery. Although, remember, veins can have thick muscular walls too. Um, and But the best thing is looking for a nice, thick, internal elastic lamina. And that's what you see right here. This purple line is just an artifact. That's just a fold of the tissue, so ignore that. But see this little squiggly band here? It's a lot easier to see on a light microscope, not a scan slide, because if you flip your condenser, this is a kind of a three-dimensional structure. It's like separate from the, the tissue around it. And anything that's kind of got that three-dimensionality to it, um, flipping the condenser on the microscope will make it suddenly stand out and look kind of refractile. So a lot of times when I'm looking at these, you know, a lot of people like to do uh, VVG Verhoff von Giesen elastic stain. I honestly feel like most of the time, looking carefully, I can actually see the elastic lamina just on, on, on the H&E and can see if it's disrupted. So um, the disruption is a little harder to show here, but basically we know we're dealing with the vessel and uh, an artery here because of the lamina. This, even without the arteritis, this is not a normal artery. The, the intima, the part on the inside towards the lumen side of the elastic lamina is super thick. It's really thick and it's got this kind of mixoid change. So this is intimal hyperplasia, which probably means that patients probably have long-standing hypertension and that's caused a reactive thickening of the, of the intima. So that's a lot thicker intima than normally I would see on, a, on an artery, okay? But the key here is that over here on this section, and there's some of it, there's some right here, from one we'll go here, you can already see there's histiocytes and giant cells kind of attacking the wall of the vessel and they're lining up here right around where the lamina, where that elastic lamina is. And there's gonna be lymphocytes with them too in this case. And here you can really see actually very nicely the giant cells, multinucleated giant cells, background loose mononuclear histiocytes, lymphocytes, and they're just destroying the medial part of the vessel, but you know, kind of right where the elastic lamina is between the intima and the media. And so this is a great example of giant cell arteritis. Now, a lot of times what I see when I see these biopsies, they almost always have been suspected to have temporal arteritis because they have facial pain and you know vision problems. And an astute physician recognizes that, tests them, finds that they've got an elevated C-reactive protein and SED rate, and they put them on steroids. And so within a, not too long after steroids, they begin to lose all this inflammation. And then what we will see on after the inflammation has resolved, we can still tell that there's been temporal arteritis there probably because the elastic lamina gets distorted or dissolved in those areas. And so I look uh, carefully for, for disruption of the elastic lamina. And when I find that, even without giant cells, I'll say that it, it's consistent with treated uh, temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis. So in any case, this is a really nice example. And I, I just, I think, I, I don't know if I've ever actually got to see one in practice that came in like this. They're almost, I think everyone I've ever seen has been treated before. So really, a uh, really nice example here. And of course, it's an important thing to recognize in patients because, uh, you know, if you don't treat it, there's a potential for blindness. So, so serious problem if it's missed. Okay, seven. Yeah. And then underneath that was leukocytic plastic uh, vasculitis, just as like a reactive phenomenon. So I saw like nuclear debris, mm -hmm. RBC extravasation, some fibrin deposition, and then expanded vessel wall. So a really nice LCD. Yeah. If you didn't see the, the massive tick sitting on the skin surface, and I, I love when you get the biopsy with the tick still embedded. You can, and I'm not an uh, entomologist, so I don't know all the tick parts, but it's kind of like a world within a world to go see this, you know, thing that's biting the human skin and see it's got its its own different organs. And and you can see like it's, a, it's skeletal muscle. If you look closely, you can see little, little muscle bundles in here and some other stuff. I don't know what all of it is, but it's kind of wild. And then the wall is sometimes, some parts of it are pink and some parts of this yellow stuff we call chitin, right? C-H-I-T-I-N, chitin is in the exoskeleton of a lot of arthropods, or maybe, I guess, probably all arthropods. And then here's the tick mouth parts. So a lot of times what we see on a punch of a retained tick mouth parts, we see arthropod bite reaction changes and just a little fragment or cross section of one of these embedded down in the dermis. So anytime I see this yellow chitin stuff in the dermis, probably a tick mouth part. 
I imagine that a, a stinger from a bee or a wasp embedded would look the same, but I don't think I've ever seen someone biopsy one of those. But if you ever happen to, for some reason, find one of those that are biopsy it, please send me a recut because I've never seen what a bee stinger looks like, but I imagine it might have some overlap with this. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, please send me a picture. Thanks. And I think it, I'm glad you noticed that because it'd be easy to just say, oh, tick, cool, and then move on to the next case. But, but the nice thing that we can learn from this is that you can sometimes see leukocytoclastic vasculitis and fibrin thrombi and or fibrin thrombi in association with arthropod bites, tick bites, also with scabies. Scabies can have the same kind of thing. It can have fibrin thrombi in the setting of scabies. So um, we wrote a paper about that. Actually, my partner, Sarah Shalin, from my former uh, practice, uh, she first picked that up on a biopsy of a kid and saw fibrin thrombi and was like, well, maybe this kid has a coagulopathy. And they said, now the kid's gone home. They're fine. And turns out the kid had scabies. We just didn't see the organism. Then she started looking at other cases. And lo and behold, fibrin thrombi are present under scabies pretty often, actually. So in any case, it's a nice little clue. But yeah, the, the, this is a, a lot of fibrin thrombi here underneath this tick bite. Pretty cool. All right, case uh, eight. Um, so this one looks like uh, primarily actually down in the adipose and sub Q, so fasciculitis, and um, you categorize this one as a lobular fasciculitis. Um, and so there's a bit of a differential for that to really distinguish them. I, I have to look at, at closer power. I don't know that I could say too much. Um, well, can I ask you from here, what do you think this infiltrate is made of mostly? Wait, it looks a little bit like histiocytic. Good. Histiocytes. That, when you see, and there are, yes, definitely will be lymphocytes, but when you see an infiltrate in the dermis or subcutis and it's kind of pink or gray, it's probably histiocytes, right? Not always, but probably because it's something with cytoplasm. Other, if it's really blue, then it would be either neutrophils or lymphocytes. So that can be a helpful clue. But yeah, these are histiocytes. And they're arranged into kind of nodules, which we could call granulomas probably, right? Yep. All right. Yeah. So what do you think it is then? So I thought it was nodular vasculitis. Good. So yeah, this is, this is a nodular vasculitis um, or uh, if you like, erythema indoratum. And there's debate over whether those are the same thing or slightly different things. But I think a lot of people tend to lump them together. It's something that I've... I, I don't think I've ever encountered a real case of this, a bona fide case in practice. I've only seen it in teaching and study sets. And the thought is that many cases are related to tuberculosis, that the, it's like a tuberculid, right? Or I think that's how it kind of is categorized, that the person has tuberculosis elsewhere, the circulating antigens activate immune complexes or cause a hypersensitivity reaction or co a combination of those. And then it causes vasculitis with associated necrotizing granulomas in the subcutis forming of paniculitis, right? And so, and these, uh, uh, they can uh, ulcerate and scar. It can be like kind of a more severe sort of paniculitis. And you can see, I mean, there's a lot of fat necrosis here. There's necrotic debris and neutrophils and then granulomas everywhere. So of course, the main thing here is you've got to exclude infection, right? I mean, this could easily be a atypical mycobacterial infection or deep fungal, maybe, probably a little less likely. So you'd need to do stains and or cultures here to make sure that there's no infectious etiology. I looked around at this slide earlier and I could not actually find good vasculitis here. And that's a feature that you're supposed to have, although there have been some studies that have suggested that you can sometimes not have vasculitis in this. But there are other people that say, no, you have to have vasculitis. I don't know. Like I said, I've never even seen this in real life that I know of. So maybe it's seen me, but I have not recognized it. But I think this is a pretty pretty nice biopsy of one. And yes, as you said, this is classically one of the paniculidities that is predominantly lobular, although it also does have septal lighting. So it's kind of septal and lobular, but definitely you can easily from low power see that the that that the bulk of the inflammatory and infiltrative component is filling the lobules of fat, but the, the septa are pretty expanded. See, they're very fibrous. If you took all the granulomas out of the middle, then the septa would actually look pretty good for like erythema nodosum. So, but with all this extensive lobular involvement, probably not erythema nodosum. So the other thing I might think of if I looked at this, if I didn't see all the necrosis would be like sarcoidosis of the subcutis, daria russi. So, but then when we look closer here, all the necrosis and some neutrophils and debris would argue against that, I think. So anyway, I couldn't find the good damaged vessel. Maybe the damaged or vasculitic uh, vessels have been just uh, consumed by all the 
the granulomas. So nice erythema interatum or nodular vasculitis. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I would have to see this for my inner life. Yes, of um, course. I'd be like, uh, do they want a rash? Do they want to get a lesion? Could this be a, like a benign like my keratosis? And then closer up, you can see that there is pigment. And that pigment. Yeah, there's pigment right there. A little hard. Yeah, good. This is being put in PPE. Yeah, exactly. This is this is uh, exactly as you said in real life. Without any history, I would think of a lichenoid dermatitis or lichenoid keratosis first because it does look band-like here. But when we get closer, you can see that the lymphocytes are, and you can even appreciate from here that even though they're band-like, they are a little bit kind of localized in lob, like little nodules around the the vessels here. Although, admittedly, though, because I know what it is, I can say, oh, yes, you can clearly see. But uh, in real life, I would probably think that's harder to pick up on. And so the, uh, there's usually lymphocytes around the papillary dermal vessels. There's going to be uh, hemorrhage. And there's going to be um, uh, hemosiderin in most cases. Although I, I promise I've seen things that I thought fit perfectly for pigment and purpuric dermatosis that did not have any hemosiderin. So in, you can do stains, obviously, to prove that that's hemocytorin. You can do like a Prussian blue and iron stain. And this was, I think, uh, clinically was lichen aureus, that, which is the form of pigment of purpuric dermatosis or pigment of purpuric eruption, whichever you like. And there are, as you guys know, there are multiple different patterns of pigment of purpuric dermatosis. Some of them are just lymphocytes around vessels. Others make more of a lichenoid band. Sometimes it's with spongiosis. Supposedly, there's ones that can be granulomatous, although I... Every time I've ever tried to make that diagnosis, it didn't seem to really actually fit, but, but it has been described that you can have a granulomatous form, so pigmented purpuric dermatosis. And um, they, some people think at least some of the cases are a lymphocytic vasculitis, that the lymphocytes are damaging the vessels. Okay, fine. Maybe so, because uh, there is hemorrhage, but, but they don't usually have neutrophils. They don't have leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So pigmented purpuric dermatosis. All right, case 10. This one had um, very vascular inflammation at low power, but also these like very eosinophilic areas. Mm -hmm. And when you zoom in, there are a ton of EOs in here. And there are these like brightly eosinophilic deposits in the collagen bundle. Yeah. Which look like the flame figures. Yes. Um, well, not like 100% specific to wells. That's like wells syndrome is the first thing that comes uh -huh. to mind. But if there was vasculitis, you could have turned strout or yep. depending on the clinical, like eosinophilic annular erythema, which we've seen recently. Uh -huh. but depends on the clinical. Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great uh, differential. The key here, of course, is the flame figure. And look, even from like even on this scan from like 0.5x, you can see them, right? They're these bright pink purple or orange purple blobs, right, in the dermis. And you can see that the degenerated collagen sometimes seems to almost float like in the middle of them. And so when you have numerous eosinophils, they begin to degranulate. The collagen kind of dies and gets coated in the granules. We can't really see the granules here on this scan, um, as well as you can see on, on, again, when you can flip a condenser on a light microscope. But yeah, this all this bright flame stuff is eosinophil granules coating the uh, dead and dying collagen bundles. So I feel like anytime you see a ton of EOs, start looking and see if you can find some flame figures. And then, yes, there are some lymphocytes around the vessels. Also, the, the dermis is very edematous. Look at how pale that papillary dermis is. You can see here, actually, the papillary dermis is beginning to almost fall apart and kind of lift up and make almost like a kind of a edema type of blister um, overlying it. And so that's how this is, like you said, Wells syndrome. And Wells syndrome, also known as eosinophilic cellulitis, is kind of a debatable entity about what exactly it is. The way I was taught, and I think kind of makes sense, is that basically this is like a really exuberant dermal hypersensitivity reaction in which we can't identify why the patient, what the patient is 
having a reaction to. So it basically is like you've ruled out bug bite, you've ruled out drug eruption, and so it's idiopathic, robust, a dermal hypersensitivity reaction, classically with flame figures. Okay, so, so it does require clinical workup to exclude other things. I've seen great flame figures in bug bites, really good ones. And also, like you said, there's this entity, um, erythem or, sorry, um, eosinophilic annular erythema, EAE, which some people think is kind of an annular ring-shaped clinical presentation of Wells syndrome. And other people think it's different because, you know, that's, that's the thing is we like to argue about stuff. And then, um, yes, you can see some similarities of flame figure-ish type things in uh, Churg-Strauss sometimes. So this is a really nice example of Wells syndrome and flame figures. And, um, oh yeah, and I said bug bite, and I felt like there was something else I was going to tell you, but no, I guess not. Okay. What's this one? 11. Yeah, this one from, yeah, the reason why I looked at it, it looks pretty normal. Um, I guess one thing that did catch my eye is it does seem like there's some separation of the, the collagen on the dermis. Yeah, yeah, the collagen's got a lot of white space between it. And yes, could be artifact, but this seems pretty prominent. So there's probably a lot of edema in here. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some neutrophils and eosinophils, um, within them and, yeah. and directly around. Yeah, and um, probably scattered out here, I, it's again hard to see on this scan, but I see orange cells right there, and I see some cells with little tiny multilobated nuclei, which must be neutrophils. So yeah, this is a great example of... Uh, urticaria. Yeah, I agree. I would definitely, this is actually, this is what I like to see for urticaria. And again, I find the vessel dilation with the neutrophils when you see that, not all urticaria has it, but when you see a bunch of neutrophils kind of collecting in the vessel, in these little small vessels superficially, I find that really helpful to support a diagnosis of urticaria. And then again, scattered EOs and uh, maybe a few mast cells here and there, uh, not clustering, just kind of scattered. So all of that's very nice. So that's actually a really good Really good classic example, I think, of urticaria. Edema, sparse inflammation, neutrophils in the vessels and scattered in the dermis. <clears throat> 12. All right. So the first thing that jumps out is right where your mouth just was, that kind of medium-sized vessel with a lot of the, the features you think for vasculitis, like RPC extravasation, carioruptors, neutrophils. Um, fiber and that kind of stuff. It doesn't have a significant superficial like small vessel component. So maybe you can think more of the medium vessel vasculitis like a polyarteritis nodosa. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, I have to say this is like the smallest uh, vessel that I've ever seen. Uh, th this case uh, is the smallest example of pan, poly polyarteritis nodosa, that I've seen, actually. Usually the vessels are a good bit bigger than this, but I guess this one's, it's in the right area. Like you said, it's just, it's one vessel. It doesn't have small vessel vasculitis up here, and it's kind of near the dermal sub-Q junction, which is where you usually see the vessel of polyarteritis nodosa. And from all the ones I've ever seen, and it's not, I've not seen tons of cases, but they always are like one vessel, really obvious LCV, and, and I don't, you don't see multiple vessels. I usually only see one cross section and one punch biopsy. I, I think it's possible that you could see more, but I feel like just because of the size of it and the way it's kind of usually a single vessel, kind of a, an area, like a cord like area, clinically, I feel like you're probably on a punch, you're just going to get one cross section of it. So I, I did pull up one other example of this to show you from my, pictures here this is more like typical see the vessel is really prominently inflamed it's packed full of an organizing thrombus it's got destruction of the vessel wall and it's right down here right between the dermis subcutis right around that area and here's a closer look at it and you can see the fibrin and and uh, um, various inflammatory cells including neutrophils here and then the vessel wall has got neutrophils and it's beginning to get destroyed by the uh, inflammation so that's a pretty good example of polyarteritis nodosa. Okay, 13. All right, so this
this one is, was a little uh, challenging for me to um, come up with a diagnosis. The, I guess the striking thing is that we do not have epi. It's missing, so it's hard to say is it, why did it separate, is, is it an artifact, did it separate uh, because it died, so it's hard to say. But then I guess you start looking uh, into the dermis and you see these vessels, they're very large um, and diffuse, right? The eosinophilic deposition in the vessel wall, which is fibrin. Yep. Um, but you do not see the destruction of the vessel with the um, like neutrophils and hairy rectus and that kind of stuff. Um, however, you still get a little bit of um, blood cell extravasation in some places. Mm -hmm. um, there's other foci of vessels that look um, like cannibal, cannibal vessels like Dr. Bish was describing in the stasis. So um, it's perhaps this is a leg site. Um, so it's a vasculopathy, I guess, not a vasculitis. Okay. And, um, I guess lividoid vasculopathy, but honestly, I, I do not know how to come to this conclusion. Yeah, I think I think like you said, this is very challenging. Again, you're not you're doing these cases cold with no history, which obviously in real life, you know, it's it is good to practice this way. And I try to look at my cases this way, and then and then compare the history to see if what I'm seeing from the pattern makes sense with the clinical. And I think it's a nice way to kind of check myself. Um, and, uh, but yes, it, it's a lot harder here because it's hard to orient yourself to like which way is up even, right? I mean, probably this could be dermis, but I also thought when I first looked at this, I mean, are we way down like near the fascia or something? It's really hard to tell because the tissue is so abnormal and distorted, so many reactive changes and there's no epidermis. But you highlighted the key point and the fat has got a lot of like fat necrosis, reactive, there's fat necrosis here, reactive fibrotic changes. But the key is the vessels, right? The vessels, and obviously this is vasculitis, vasculopathy session. So the, the vessels are definitely abnormal. They have real thick walls. The endothelial cells are swollen and there's a ton of bright red fibrin in the wall and around the outside of the vessel. In some areas, actually even like thrombus formation in the vessel. And like you said, you, you nicely picked up on the background point that up there, the vessels are kind of clustering up into the, I guess, the cannonball arrangement that you guys were talking about that you can see in the setting of, of venous insufficiency and stasis. Um, so yes, this is, this is lividoid vasculopathy, also known as atrophy blanche, which usually, of course, occurs like on the ankle region and the skin breaks down and then heals with these like white scarred areas. And there's kind of two settings. Some people have this as a form of kind of thrombotic vasculopathy and other people get it from just stasis, I guess. The, I, I was just reading about that and I didn't realize that it was that some people subdivided into two kind of <clears throat> etiology. So I thought that was interesting. I always thought of it as just being a severe form of stasis related change, but evidently not everyone has severe stasis that gets this. So, um, but yes, you get, you get fibrin in the wall of the vessels, fibrin making little thrombi in the vessels. The vessels get very damaged over time. And, um, but you don't really have a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. You may see some scattered neutrophils kind of diapedicing out of the vessel, but you're not going to see like an actual florid leukocytoclastic vasculitis change. So we see vessels like this actually in really severe stasis. Um, on a regular basis, I'll encounter like a, one or two vessels with a bright fiber around it, or even a couple little thrombi. And normally I see thrombi in the vessels in the dermis. I want to get the patient worked up for coagulopathy or something, but I feel like in severe stasis in the papillary dermis, if I see a couple thrombi, I feel like that's just normally stasis related that the blood slowed down so much it begins to make a little thrombus and it's probably not a sign of systemic coagulopathy. It depends on the clinical scenario, I guess. But yeah, this is, this is <clears throat> lividoid vasculopathy, aka atrophy blanche. Okay, 14. what um, Dr. Kelly was talking about, kind of like a light purple area in the fat area, but there's, there's also, uh, like, it hits your face or what do you say? There's something kind of purple around the vessels too. Yeah. The dermis. Um, from closer, it looked like there were neutrophils, um, a lot of neutrophils, and Yeah, I mean, it's like an abscess, right? I mean, <clears throat> it's a big pocket of neutrophils here, as well as kind of histiocytes too, right? Yeah, and right there, right in this soft and little skin, 
because it looked like a little robot. Good, yeah. Very astute. Uh, so, uh, we were thinking this was Arathena and the Dozen of Crowstone, not Lazarus and Sassarus, because they had the robots. Good. Yes, you're right. The the two things you, you could think of, nodular um, uh, vasculitis or erythema indoratum, but once you start seeing cells that have holes in them with this kind of fine granular bluish stuff, when I see that, I think of the globi of leprosy. Also, you can see an essentially identical appearance in other forms of mycobacterial infection like atypical mycobacteria, okay? And um, in, in practice, honestly, if I saw this like today on my biopsy tray, I would not think of erythema nodosum leprosum because obviously leprosy is quite uncommon <clears throat> in my practice. Um, in my former job in Arkansas, because of armadillos, we would see a couple cases of leprosy, usually armadillo related per year, but I never ended up seeing one of these reactions that I know of. So this is kind of what the one of the type two reactions and I don't fully understand all of the all of the different subtypings of leprosy and leprosy reactions. But basically the idea, this usually occurs when people have lepromatous or borderline lepromatous, one of those. They have numerous organisms, one of the multibacillary forms of leprosy, and then they get treated. And then all of the antigen from the leprae organisms creates like an immune complex um, that circulate and, and uh, cause a bunch of neutrophils and vascular damage. So you will, I think, still see a lot of times the background of leprosy and that's what these all are. Like you said, there's tons of, of uh, cells packed with uh, leprae organisms up here in the dermis. Same thing. You've got like that linear kind of uh, serpiginous linear granulomatous stuff, but it's not the tight grain, not tight sarcoidal or tuberculoid type granulomas, but the loose granulomas that are made up of those uh, leprosy filled histiocytes. So that's why they kind of are loose, loose, fluffy looking histiocytes, almost bubbly looking, and they're tracking along vessels and nerves here and then you're getting pockets of neutrophils and the neutrophils are the, the part that's the reaction. So that's the erythema nodosum leprosum. But again, in real life practice, I would also wonder about you know, other things like atypical mycobacteria, which sometimes make abscesses. Cool, I've never actually seen a real case of that. All right, 15. Yeah, like every vessel is filled. There's like not a patent vessel here. Every single vessel is packed full of thrombus, right? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Like there's a good one, yeah. So that combination, we can think of a couple of things. The one that we really think of classically is like a levamisol contaminated cocaine. Um, I think you can get it in septic vasculitis too. Um, so those would be the two things that I think of. Yeah, right away when I see lots of fibrin thrombi, and oftentimes there'll be ischemic change of the skin. Surprisingly, this does not show any ischemia yet that I can appreciate. So maybe they caught it really quickly, but there is numerous, uh, numerous fibrin thrombi plugging up the vessels, tons of hemorrhage. And then um, even though these are classically supposed to be, the levamisol vasculitis is supposed to have vasculitis plus thrombi. The, I feel like the cases I've seen, the vasculitis part is kind of subtle. Like it's not tons of neutrophils. And I don't know if that's just that I happen to see a couple cases that look that way. Um, I guess I should probably read up on it more and see maybe that's classic. But but yeah, lots of fibrin thrombi and the vessels are damaged and beginning to get necrotic, but there's not a ton of neutrophils in this case. And again, I, I, the most recent one that I saw was the same way. It didn't have a, a lot of neutrophils, but definitely did have vascular damage. So different than other like um, uh, like fibrin thrombi systemic coagulopathy situations. So definitely the, these patients need to get tested for cocaine and a, and a good clinical history, which sometimes is hard to elicit that they've been using cocaine and that levamisole is used as like a cutting agent in uh, um, uh, cocaine sometimes and that induces this process and then people get the black black or purple eschars or, or dying in ischemic uh, tissue like on the tip of the nose or the ears classically, right? Um, the kind of distal sites like that. And uh, you can see why they get that ischemia because all of their vessels are packed full of thrombi. 
And you're right, you could think of other things like septic emboli. Uh, the rare times I've seen that, it was not so numerous. It was like a couple emboli. Again, I don't know. I, have, I don't see that very often. So, so, but yeah, it did look kind of like this, but it was more limited to just a few vessels. And I find that in septic emboli, again, the few I've seen, it's actually, even though there are supposed to be organisms in the thrombi, quite hard to find them. Even with careful looking and serial sections and and doing, uh, you know, gram stain, I find that the, the bacteria are really sparse and hard to see most of the time. So, um, and that's what I've been told by other people with a lot more experience than me too. But this is levamisol vasculopathy from cocaine use. Oh, and I would also want, to, uh, would definitely keep mixed cryoglobulinemia in my thought right here too, because it can give you that similar look and have the vascular damage with it. So I would definitely uh, can put cryo in my differential. Okay, 16. All right, so rather large, very deep, mm -hmm. vast, it has a huge thrombus in it. Um, so initial thought, this might be potentially polyarteritis, what is the versus thrombophlebitis? So determining whether it's a vein or an artery is going to be helpful. Okay. Um, you know, hard to tell, you can't really use round as a criteria when it's chock full of uh -huh. Yeah, so superficial thrombophlebitis, uh, often with people that have systemic inflammatory or, or coagulation issues. I, I don't think I've ever actually seen, well, maybe one time I saw this biopsy, but I don't often see it biopsy. I feel like it often gets recognized clinically. Um, and this is kind of interesting that there, most of what we're seeing here is actually like blood. See, they're actual erythrocytes. There is some a beginning of fibrin thrombus formation. I imagine this was probably a large kind of plug of fibrin thrombus where part of it was more solid and this area was just kind of congealed blood stuck in the middle that hadn't fully turned into thrombus yet. But we know that must be a thrombus somewhere in here because there's no way a normal vessel is going to be this big in the subcutis. That is way, way bigger than any vessel should ever be at this level that I can think of. I've never seen a normal vessel that size at this location uh, in the, this level of the skin. So right away, that's abnormal. And like you said, um, even though from reading, again, I read up on this since I don't see it very often, you, you do often see some degree of inflammation associated with it. Although this one I feel like is not much inflammation. There's reactive change around it. See, this is abnormal here. There's a little bit of inflammation. There's a lot of edema and fibrin and degenerative changes in the subcutis around the vessel because it's really irritated, I think, from the vessel expanding. But um, yes, polyarteritis nodosa should have really florid inflammatory component in the vessel wall and around it, and also will have an elastic laminate. It will be an artery, whereas thrombophlebitis will be a vein. So that's going to be, if you needed to in real life, you could do a Virhoff von Giesen elastic stain to help prove it if you're having trouble. Um, but yeah, that's a, a nice example of something, like I said, that I don't usually see. So superficial thrombophlebitis. Now look, another temporal artery. What's going on here? So I think this was just an example of normal temporal artery. So it has like a nice like um, reflex muscularis and then the prominent internal elastic membrane. Yeah, here. And I didn't see any inflammation in these. So I think this was just a, an example of normal. Well, it is, I, I agree. It's no, no, um, no giant cell arteritis, but there is one finding that I guess you could argue is normal because it's very common but it's is not te not probably going to be seen like in your temporal artery, but it might be in someone else. What's going on with all this and this here? Is this just some cholesterol um, like deposits? So this is calcification. It's a little hard to tell here because it's not quite the same purple, but it's like fragments of ca okay. of calcium. So there's calcium deposits, multifocal. And as when we look around, you can see it's actually everywhere. It's all these uh, crumbled and kind of breaking up calcium deposits in the vessel wall, kind of located right along the media. I'm sorry, the uh, elastic lamina, which is interesting. And um, and I've seen this before uh, in the temporal artery, particularly right along the, it's like the, almost the elastic lamina is getting calcified. So there's kind of two different things you could think of in this setting. One, you could wonder, is this calcification associated with atherosclerosis? Okay, so in atherosclerosis, where the cholesterol 
and the atheroma plaque builds up is in the intima of the vessel. So here the intima is thickened again. I, to me, this is thicker than I would say a normal vessel. So probably this is an older person with hypertension, but I don't see any deposits of like lipid filled histiocytes or cholesterol crystals, those long clefts. I don't see those in the middle here to make me think of a plaque. And I feel like most of the calcs here are in the, the elastic lamina or on the other side of it, even into the medial layer. So when I see calcification in the media of a vessel, a big, a big thick muscular artery, there's a name for that. It's called Monkeyberg's arterial calcific stenosis or medial calcific stenosis. And it's a relatively common finding that is either associated with degenerative changes of old age and or hypertension, we think. Um, that, that is, but we see it in vessels a lot and is uh, calcification in the vessel wall that's not necessarily associated with atherosclerosis, but it's just kind of a degenerative calcification that happens in older people. And it's important, I think, for dermatologists to know about um, because we, in pathology, we see this regularly calcifications in the media and we get used to kind of ignoring it. So it's important for dermatologists to know about Monkeyberg's calcific stenosis because you don't want to confuse this with calciphylaxis. This is basically an incidental finding that is of no, I mean, it, it is a pathologic finding, but it's, they don't need to do anything about it. This person already has had hypertension for a long time, probably, and is probably being treated for it. So I will mention it uh, sometimes depends on the setting, but this is just an incidental finding that is not in, important, whereas calciphylaxis obviously is urgent, you know, really serious thing with high mortality. So I think uh, pathologists need to get more training in calciphylaxis because we get used to seeing calcs and vessel walls that don't mean anything. And then calciphylaxis, it's actually really serious. And I think derms need to be aware of monkeybergs to know that, yes, sometimes calcs are not calciphylaxis and are totally fine. So the biggest thing always for calciphylaxis, the clinical situation has to fit with calciphylaxis to make that diagnosis. So this is a pretty nice, good example of that, that calcific uh, change in the media of a muscular artery. And in this case, it's the temporal artery. Okay, 18. Okay, so this one has um, some inflammation more in the superficial dermis, um, and then some uh, dermal edema that you can see as well. Um, at higher power, the inflammation was, was densely neutrophilic. Um, so I was sweets with this one. Um, I'm assuming a lot of this chapter vasculitis um, associated changes with sweets that I think are, are um, generally favored to be like more reactive than, than primary and, and long-standing lesions. Um, some of the vessels here look maybe a little bit demodest, but I didn't see frank vasculitis. Good, excellent. Yes, this is this is uh, fits really nicely for sweet syndrome, um, uh, febrile and neutrophilic dermatosis, and I like that you pointed out not only the fact that we've got a dense dermal collection of neutrophils, but also that we have really prominent papillary dermal edema. I mean, look at how loose and pale and fluffy that papillary dermis is. And if you, especially if you go out and compare like to the skin away from it, it looks, this is normal papillary dermis. This is edematous papillary dermis. It really get you know, as you guys know, these are like very edematous, juicy, uh, reddish, you know, lesions clinically. And the reason they have that puffy, juicy look is from all that edema. And then they're rich in neutrophils. And like you said, sometimes you can see there are some people, I think classically people say you should not have vasculitis in sweets. Well, I tell you, I've seen things that fit perfectly for sweets and definitely had vasculitis to my eye, at least. Um, I do think though, that sometimes it, it can be a little hard to tell like what's vasculitis versus neutrophils coming out of blood vessels. Because guess what? That's how the neutrophils get into the dermis. They have to come out of the vessel, right? They're, you can see them here. They're filling the vessel and then they use diapodesis to get out of the vessel. And so when you have a billion neutrophils somewhere, yeah, it's going to look like they're coming out of the vessel wall because they are. And sometimes it's hard to tell if the vessel's actually vasculitic or not. So, you know, I would say that most of the time you don't see like frank fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel wall, but neutrophils and some dust sometimes, I feel like I've seen that multiple times in sweets. So that alone doesn't hold me back from sweets. But I will say that one thing is that if you see vasculitis-like changes, it should be within the infiltrate area. If I start seeing 
you know, uh, little vessels away from the main area. Now, we don't always get a nice biopsy like this that gives us both. A lot of times it's a punch and the whole thing looks like sweets. But if I started seeing vasculitis away from the sheets of neutrophils, then I might get start to get worried that maybe this is actually a vasculitic process that is just getting a pustule-like area. And then that would be worrisome for like systemic vasculitis. Also, of course, the clinical helps because sweets has, you know, these discrete like juicy lesions. And I feel like vasculitis has kind of a different um, picture. So if you, in real life, if you had some time where you were concerned between sweets and vasculitis clinically, if you can biopsy one of the juicy uh, uh, demitus nodules and also biopsy an area that looked kind of purpuric but not a demitus away from one of those nodules, that might be helpful because if I saw like an earlier area that didn't have a lot of neutrophils but had vasculitis, then that would support that maybe this is not sweets and is actually vasculitis. And of course, infection has to be ruled out, but usually these are so distinct clinically and you guys clinically know this is going to be sweets. And then we see this and we say, yep, it, it fits perfectly with, with sweets. But in, of course, we do want to make sure that we're not missing an infectious process. And then we don't have an example of histiocytoid sweets to show, but sometimes sweets can look more like histiocytes than like neutrophils. And those cases can really closely overlap leukemia cutis. And are, I find them still very challenging, even though I've seen multiple cases, those are real tricky, but we don't have one to show here today. But um, just to, the best way to conceptualize that though, if you struggle to understand histiocytoid sweets, and I, I think I did for a long time, the way that it finally made the most sense to me is there are not, they are not probably histiocytes. They are actually neutrophils. They're just a little bit younger neutrophils. They're left shifted. So instead of having the well-developed multi-lobated nuclei, they look more like a single nucleus, um, like a band would, um, or a seg, you know, one of those kind of, uh, left shift neutrophils. And so that's the, they look and they stain like neutrophils, but they look kind of like histiocytes because they're not as, as fully developed. And that's why they can begin to look kind of like leukemia cells, which myeloid leukemia is really, really primitive the precursors of neutrophil, right? So that's where the overlap can come because the staining can be very similar. The look can be similar. And usually if I'm going to make a diagnosis of histiocytoid sweets, I'm going to tell you guys to do a CBC and watch the patient closely because I'm always worried about subtle leukemia cutis mimicking histiocytoid sweets. So, and I think that's a good, a good general rule. If you get a diagnosis of histiocytoid sweets, keep a close eye on that patient. Okay. If it responds like sweets and their CBC is, doesn't have blasts, that's really good and reassuring, but just keep a close eye on them. Okay. Just feel like that's a, a safe way to do things. All right, 19. Oh, wait, you guys have to be done at what, 8.45? Yep. Okay, yeah, we can do this in seven minutes, no problem. All right, what's this one? Wow. Okay, so we have a large excisional biopsy. The epidermis is necrosed. Everything. This is like mummified, yeah. right? It's like mummy skin. It's all dead. Crazy. Let's see. They're like these little, like, oh yeah. Like, oh cool. Yeah. I wonder if that is. I wonder if it's like um, I don't know, but I I would imagine it's a globules of something that they've topically like a topical agent they're putting on these big huge ulcers. I bet. Yeah. And also sometimes anytime you see a big huge ischemic ulcer like an this is like a skin infarct or an eschar right the whole thing is just dead. It looks like the same as a gangrenous toe would look. It's all dead. You can often see also thick layers of bacteria and fungus growing over big chronic ulcers, ischemic ones, and also ulcers like in pyoderma gangrenosum. I see that many times, and I think that that's totally a secondary overgrowth of like candida and skin flora and doesn't have anything to do with the etiology. But just FYI, that can look really weird when you see it. But if it's all just on the top, that's not what's causing the problem. And here's the key, right? Yeah. Or even small. Yeah, the little vessels a lot of times, right? Yeah, small, medium, but the tiny ones and the fat lobules are also yeah. filled with the calcium deposits. And this patient, of course, must have chronic renal failure, or almost yeah. certainly does, right? The vast majority of them do. So this is calciphylaxis, and that's exactly what you're looking for. Ischemia and the severity of it will depend on where you biopsy it and on how long it's been going on. This is a really dramatic, like end stage case, you know, where the, their skin is completely dying. Obviously, painful, black, purple, 
areas that become eschars and, and infarcted ulcers. And then on biopsy, you're going to see the calx and they can be either little. This is really well developed. It, we rarely get it this good, but little rings of calcium around small to medium sized vessels. You can see it in the thicker muscular vessels, but ideally I want to see it in these small vessels. That's what, to me, if I see it in bigger vessels and that's the only thing I see, like I said, you can see that in monkey bergs. But anytime I see any calcifications in the setting of a chronic renal failure and a suspicious clinical thing, I take that very seriously and worrisome for calciphylaxis until we can prove it's something else. So um, then the other thing is that sometimes it's hard to find or you don't even find it in vessels and all you can find are little tiny fragments of it in the subcutis um, in between fat cells along little septa. Here's a little vessel right here with a ring of cr crumbled calx around it. Yeah, so that's calciphylaxis, really serious, obviously. And a very, very dramatic example here. Okay, 20. And you can just tell me the diagnosis since I'm running behind, and then we'll just zip through them. <clears throat> so this one, I, it's, it's hard for me to tell where it is, but like a spinal cord muscle. Yeah. It could be like part of the hydratinitis, but I couldn't tell the location based on the stuff. Good. Yeah, this is a cyst wall neutrophils making an abscess and then around it you got granulation tissue brisk lymphocytes and plasma cells and scar so it could just be a big ruptured cyst but in the right setting this could also fit perfectly with the kind of draining sinus that you see in hydradenitis i have another example pulled up here this is hydradenitis suppurativa again it's kind of like a complex cyst i find one of the helpful things is there's usually like abundant loose granulation tissue and even if you don't have a true cyst lining, you'll have like these pseudo cysts that are formed in the middle of this very edematous granulation tissue. And usually because it's a chronic recurring process, there's a lot of scar in the background. Here's another one. And you can tell here that we're in the axilla or the groin because look at these big apocrine glands, right? So that tells us right away, those are apocrine glands. We're in that in one of the fold sites probably. And then this one just has like an abscess. So it can look just like an abscess, it can look like a ruptured cyst, and it can look like a sinus tract with a granulation tissue that's kind of loose and falling apart and making these pseudocystic spaces. So any combination of those, and of course I got another clinical. If they want hydradenitis, or if you guys think it looks like hydradenitis, then any of these things I'll say consistent with hydradenitis. And I don't routinely stain them. If it clinically is good for hydradenitis, I don't go staining for infection, because A, that is gonna be a lot of time spent looking at this, and B, they, they are not infectiously driven. And so the, to me, the clinical is the important thing there. And if there's any doubt, cultures probably would be the way to go. But obviously, these are not driven as if they're not an infectious process, despite the abundant inflammation. Okay, 21, whenever it pulls up here. Come on. Okay, 21. Yeah, chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis, various reactive changes or ulcer in the epidermis, these little proliferative vessels here that are a kind of a chronic reaction to the ischemia, fibrinoid necrosis right underneath the ulcer, and if you're lucky, a piece of degenerated cartilage underneath, painful nodule on the helix or anti-helix. Good. 22. LCV. LCV, yeah neutrophils, fibrinoid necrosis, hemorrhage, nuclear dust around vessels. If we, if we just went at this right, we could have been done in like 15 minutes. I'm sorry, I always talk so long. All right, how about this one, 23? Um, closer up, we can see some seals and sponge, so we were thinking the bites. Yeah, bites do get sponge or ulcer in the middle sometimes, not always. But again, this is an example of just how florid bite reactions can be, that they can have, they can have fibrin, uh, they can have vascular damage, um, fibrin thrombi, and, and you know, vasculitis, and even flame figures, uh, exuberant bite reaction can be really florid. And almost always, of course, the EOs and inflammation are gonna go deep um, in a bug bite reaction. Okay, 24. This is acrocyte. Papilledermal edema and a bunch of lymph, so this is pernia. Yeah, perfect example. Acral skin, abundant edema in the papillary dermis, superficial and deep lymphocytes, pernio. If you put this same pattern somewhere else, not on acral skin, then what would you think of? Edema and then superficial and deep. 
kind of looks like PMLE, polymorphous okay. light eruption can look like this, right? Um, so I feel like if it looks like PMLE, but it's on acral skin, then I think about pernio, perniosis. And sometimes there's a little bit of hemorrhage because some people think this is a form of like a lymphocytic type of vasculitis where you get damage to the vessels. And I don't know if I see it here, but I often find lymphocytes around the eccrine coils in pernio. I've seen that multiple times. So perniosis or chilblains, if you like. 25? Yeah, solar purpura, just hemorrhage in the dermis, sometimes little uh, pseudocystic spaces. And there have been described an inflammatory variant where you can have neutrophils and inflammatory cells mixed into the solar purpura. So that's uh, it's something I just learned about at a, a meeting a year or so ago. So I, I don't know if I've seen it. I guess I've seen a couple times where I've seen that in practice, but usually it's just blood in the dermis. And then clinically, obviously, you're going to have purpuric areas on uh, sun damaged skin of older people. And then finally, 26. Yeah, so a diffuse infiltrate in the dermis with a mixture of lymphs, plasma cells, EOs, and neutrophils. I'm trying to find a place where I can get the high power to show you better. But the, the neutrophils are like evenly scattered throughout, which I feel is such a distinct pattern that neutrophils usually are not evenly interspersed with lymphs and, and plasma cells and EOs with newts mingling in between. They usually are like in aggregates or pockets or little micro abscesses and so to have them evenly sprinkled throughout here um, and then a variable amount of fibrosis can be present because this probably is granuloma facial probably exists on a spectrum with erythema elevatum thiutinum where they can have kind of a subtle fibrosing vasculitis and in the eed end of the spectrum that fibrosing vasculitis is really prominent you can begin to see it here look we don't see good lcv but we're seeing these damaged vessels with spiraling swirling onion skin kind of fibrosis around them. So I've definitely seen lesions that kind of had overlap that looked a little like EED, but clinically made more sense to be granuloma facial. So, and of course, as you guys all well know, where's the granuloma in granuloma facial? It's in the name only. There are no granulomas in the dermis in this uh, disease. So a nice example. And I like this one because it really does show you the, the relationship here between G facial and EED, because you can really see this kind of overlap. That's really really good example of it. All right, guys, I think that's everything. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great day.